Sporting Wales podcast. Supported by Dragonbet. Your go-to for Welsh sports news and views. David, a warm welcome to the podcast. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, some sporting fans will kind of not know where you live in, but you're back in New Zealand living there. Um, how's life there? Yeah, it's pretty good. I live just um, north of Christchurch. Uh, and we're in the uh, middle of our summer, so we've had uh, 37 degrees the other day, and, but it was down to around about 20 today. So, yeah, it's not bad at all. Um, yeah. Just uh, quiet. Quiet. Quiet is nice. Or is it not, David? Do you enjoy being quiet? You've been a busy man for your career. So what takes up your time? Um, now? No, not really. That's why I, I stay involved. Mostly stay involved. I actually ask myself... Why, Moff? Why do you, you know, why do you keep doing what you do? And it's because I care, actually. Um, I care about rugby. I care about Welsh rugby. Um, yeah, so, but that's why I do what I do. Yeah, well, it's good, it's good that you care. It's good to care, that's for sure. Now, um, we've got to touch on the Six Nations if we can. Have you managed mm. to watch any of it from New Zealand? I don't watch rugby any longer. No, um, fifteen. No, I don't, because I'm not going to watch a sport where the officials actually um, intrude into the game to the extent that they actually uh, affect the result of the game. I was just reading something, um, or I saw a little clip of a, a charge down um, by the Welsh players on. Uh, on the on Ford, who was taking a kick at goal, yeah, uh, and and um, then it said a headline. Oh well, he did that to soak up time because they had two in the bin. Well, I mean, does that is that really what you want to watch? Do you really think that the average person gets any sort of satisfaction out of playing against thirteen men? I mean, it's bullshit, absolute bullshit. And um, oh, I can't watch it, you know, because they are affecting the game. They affected the game, the very first game of the Six Nations with red cards. Um, they affected the very last game of the World Cup with red cards. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to watch that. I've got better things to do with my time than watch that rubbish. So you're obviously still reading the headlines. Um so is it hard to have an opinion if you're not watching the game or do you think you don't uh, need to watch? I don't need to watch it because it's all the same. It's McDonald's rugby, right? They Every team wants to play the same way. Where's the Welsh way of playing? Where's the Australian way of playing? Um, the Welsh way of playing was what actually excited me about rugby, but they don't do that. I mean, it's all bash and kick. Um, and I don't, and I don't need to to watch that. I'd, I'd need a new television set every week if I watch that rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what I mean, you know, I mean, I, you know, and and of course, the thing about the Six Nations is it's the best competition in the world mm. of rugby, mm-hmm. including the soon to be devalued Rugby World Cup. Um, but but even then, you know, you've got you've got decisions being taken out of the hands of the referee. I'm, I'm, you know, in a, in a, yeah, no, it's not, not. It's actually not worth me talking about that. I suppose you know, with with rules changes, um, all sports currently are assessing the rules in the game. You know, with with football or soccer, whatever you call it, but over there, you know, we've got VAR. They're flirting with blue cards at the moment. But I think one point from my, you know, you're right. When we watch, you know, we've watched the late Barry John clips of him recently and JPR Williams and the way they played rugby, it's entertaining. We are in uh, the sports entertainment industry, aren't we? And rugby needs no, to remember not. that at times, do you think or not? No, you're not in the sports entertainment industry. You're not even in the sports industry. And therein lies a problem when a guy with as much knowledge of rugby as you obviously have, believes you're in the sports entertainment industry, then you've got to rethink it. Because what you are in is you're in the time industry. You're you're in the industry of actually getting Gen X, Y and Z to spend their time on rugby, whether they want to play it or watch it. And it's we're, we're the attention economy now. You know, and it's got nothing to do with anything else other than being able to reach out 
and and, and capture um, those future fans. Rugby's not about me, I can tell you. The future of the game is not in my hands. I'll comment on it, but it's, you know, I've, but, but the future of everything is Gen X, Y and Z. And they don't understand that. And rugby just does not understand that because it will not change. Yeah. So what rules well, do we mom, change, David, to make it more entertaining? Uh, they, well, they won't change any of the laws of the game because if they were to do that and they were to make it safer, they would be actually giving the people on the other side of the CTE lawsuit some more ammunition because they should have made those changes ages ago. Now, I, Robbie Deans and I have been working on a game on a, on a, a game called Elevens Rugby. And I can send you, if you give me your, your email address, I can send you what that game's all about. And it's based on four things, safety, simplicity, speed and space. Uh, and I would have to tell you that Rugby 15 doesn't meet any of those criteria, not one. It's not safe. It's not simple. There's, there's hardly any speed in it and there's definitely no space. If that's what you want to watch, be my guest. I mean, I don't care about that part of it. I care about the future of the game. But, you know, if people are actually turned on by the sort of rugby that we see, we occasionally see a good game of rugby. There's no doubt about that. When Ireland might be playing New Zealand, right? But outside of that, you know, I mean, it's just... And there are two people, there are two people at fault here. One is the IRB because... Oh, sorry, World Rugby, yep. because they 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 refuse to actually change. And the second one are the coaches. Since the game went professional, coaches have become massively overpaid, in my view. But they 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 command massive salaries, and so what they do is they they don't want to lose that. So all of a sudden, we got the game after a couple of years, two or three years of professional rugby that just just contracted into a defensive game. Then they came up with this idea, oh, we'll just have these huge guys. We'll stick the, the forwards out in the backs most of the time so the backs don't get the ball. You will never see the like of JPR, Barry John, Gareth and all those guys again. You'll never see them again. So has money ruined this game, in your opinion, because results matter Absolutely. so much, Yeah. Absolutely, it's ruined the game. I was right at the beginning of professional rugby. Yeah. I did the deal. Well, five of us did the deal with News Limited, 555 million US dollars in 1995. So what's that worth today? You know, a little bit. And I never for once thought that rugby would put all of its, all of its eggs into the one basket of professional rugby. And they've wasted billions, whether it's pounds, dollars, francs, whatever, on what you could most like on players, most of whom are average at best. There's too many teams. There's too many players getting paid too much money. And the chickens are coming home to roost. Are they not? No. Look at the situation in England. <laughs> you know, even with the CVC money, they're a shambles. They can't, they can't, they're all broke. Even with the CVC money, even with the CVC money, Wales can't afford... Um, you know, four teams, barely three. But we'll talk about restructuring a bit because I think that's something that we need to get onto. But, you know, what is your opinion on world rugby's current control of rugby and potential development plans that they may have or may not have? Oh, do we see them? Do they even let us know what's going on? Um, they're more concerned about money than anything else. I mean, recently they announced that um, that they were going to increase the number of teams at the 2027 Rugby World Cup. Why? Why would they do that? Only for money? Because let's face it, it the, the bottom 12 teams are going to get thrashed. We're going to see even worse scores than we saw in the last World Cup. And um, then they did the same with sevens. They made that a, an elite competition of only 12 teams. But then they said that when people went to watch the sevens, they would all race out and start playing seven-a-side rugby. My experience with sevens is that 95% of the people that went go to a sevens tournament can't remember a thing about what happened the next day. 
Well, why is that? Because they're all pissed. It's a piss up, mate. It's not. It's not a game that you can use to actually entice people to come and play it. You know, that's all rubbish. It's just about money. That's all it's about. Yeah. Okay. So let, let, let's go back. Um, obviously, you've got the elevens idea. Which if you, you don't agree with me, argue with me. No, no. I, well, it's not that I don't disagree with you. To be honest with you, I think a lot of rugby fans, not just here in Wales but across the world, do agree with you. Do you know what I mean? So it's not. It's no point me having a debate with something that I kind of, in essence, do agree with. To be honest with you, but I think yeah. where where I'm coming from is it is, and we'll get onto it in a minute is. How do we actually make change possible? How? Who are the people? Who are the players? Who are the parties that need to sit down together and make it happen? And obviously in 2003, you kind of set up the regional structure that we have here in Wales um, yes. and something that's been there for 20 years plus now. Why doesn't that work here now? Because that, can, that, that might lead us on to kind of what doesn't work and how we move forward. Okay. So what, what happened was 99% of the clubs voted for regional rugby, right? But that didn't translate into the fans. You know, we saw with the Warriors, you know, my great friends at Pontypridd, they never supported the Warriors, you know, and, and they went, they've been through a couple of times at least. So they, you know, I mean, they're living in fantasy land. The reason it didn't it didn't work, and I've said this from around about 2014, I've said ditch regional rugby, you know, and I put out the manifesto, the manifesto. You know, if you haven't seen that, I'll send that to you as well. No, no, I've seen because it. Because there yeah. need to be there'll need to be some massive changes, right? To what to to what was needed at the time. What was needed at the time was to get the Welsh national team winning. They hadn't won anything much for 27 years. And by 2005, they won their first Grand Slam in 27 years. Mm -hmm. So it worked. And it's still working up to a point um, that the national team is, you know, is going through a rebuild. We'll get onto that in a minute. But, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's still working. But the Welsh think they've got a mortgage on parochialism. And I've got news for them. You go and see Queensland play New South Wales in rugby league or, you know, Auckland play Canterbury here. They don't. And parochialism can be a good thing or a bad thing. In Wales, it's a bad thing because everybody thinks that their team in their valley is the most important thing in Welsh rugby. And the fighting never stops between all these vested interests. And they're clubs. They're not professionals. They're clubs. Too many of them think they should be um, professional clubs. And, and there's still a situation in Wales where Division 6 and 7 players expect to get paid. That's not, how do you, that's not sustainable. It's like paying me to play golf. You know, <laughs> you wouldn't do that. What's your handicap? So, <laughs> well, well it, well, I did play off seven. And okay, okay. One, so, but I'm not going to get paid to play golf, right? Mm. So... So it's, there's those fundamental issues that are wrong with the game in Wales, and they're still wrong. You look at 2000, it's 10 years since I wrote that manifesto, and if you read it, the problems are still the same. So what would you, if, if we gave you a job here now in Wales, said, right, restructure this <laughs> now, <laughs> leave New Zealand, leave the sun. <laughs> what, what, I know you probably wouldn't take it, but like, what would you be, uh, what would you be doing straight away then? I'd focus on the um, the community game. First and foremost, I would totally focus on the community game because the players have got to come from somewhere mm. and, they'll, and they come from the community game. But the community game is being kept poor and I have got a solution for the community game in Wales and I'm not going to share it with you or anybody else in Wales unless they're really interested to learn what it is. They can become self-financing the community game with some money coming in from the professional game, but they could become self-financing. And, what's, your, and, what's your hesitance in sharing it? Because you know, obviously, no, because, no, because it's a. Um, I'm working with three guys up in up in uh, the UK. They're experts in in funding models for sport, mostly football, <clears throat> and we've come up with a a solution which starts at the community game, right? All, all I would say is that the community game needs to be separated from the professional game in Wales. 
Um, that's that's all I'll say at this stage. And it and it needs to that needs to happen so that both entities can just concentrate on what they do, and and stop this this con, this constant warring between the community game and the professional game. And and it can happen. But I'm not. I'm not going to bloody waste my time. Um, you know. I'm, well, I'm not talking about not wasting my time with you. But no, no, no. You no. know that will yeah. get out. Obviously, with you know into Welsh rugby. Why should I? You know, they don't. They don't listen to anything I say. They they're not interested in anything I do because Moffat stuffed the game up. Right. Well, hang on a minute. When I got there, Wales was trading whilst insolvent. They were they lost three thousand pounds three million pounds the year you know just that I arrived towards the end of the year mm. and the team was and the professional team was nowhere and they had eleven professional teams within twelve months we had made a three million dollar profit I had reduced the debt from seventy two million down to forty eight million um, the team was winning uh, and um, there needed to be another step. But that's that's if if that's failure in the sight of Welsh people, then oh man, why 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 am I bothered with trying to actually give them a solution to the problem they've got at the moment? As some of the problems we've got here in Wales um, are echoed across various other countries in the world as well, um, including New Zealand. Um, you know, yeah. and money is behind a lot of that because people want to leave to richer leagues, let's be honest about it. Um, coaches want to leave to richer leagues as well. Yeah. Um, young players also sadly leaving, you know, before they're kind of 16 to go to richer teams and leagues. How do we stop that happening in Wales? Because that is one thing that's kind of rife for the moment. You can't. You can't. No? You, no, no, you can't. I mean, look at football. You can't do it. You, you know, rugby's tried to emulate football and it's failed miserably. Rugby's a niche sport for crying out loud. And look at all the people that have, that have all those clubs that have gone broke, all right through the grades. But, you know, let's take England, you know, the pearl of the Northern Hemisphere. Um, look, what, look how many previous owners have said enough is enough. I've had enough of losing money. I've had enough of paying ordinary players huge wages i mean it's reality is setting in and it's not just there when you talk about going to richer leagues which one are you talking about well i, I think understand. it's well, japan and france mainly i suppose japan and honest. france yeah. yeah you're right japan and france are the only two but in japan and i know quite a lot about it because robbie dean's a good friend of mine and he's the most successful coach in the japanese professional era yeah. with saitama wild knights you know, he, he says that, that, you know, you can only have, I think it's six players, six overseas players um, on the field at any, or in the, in the squad, squad at any one time. Yeah. And, and um, he says it, it's, no, it's not a place now where you can go and pick up your retirement fund. It is really tough. It's becoming a really tough league. But the difference is it is backed by major corporations, Right. Mm. Every single one of them is is got they've got either Canon or or Toshiba or Samsung or one of those backing them. Yeah. In France, you've got all these guys, comic comic book makers, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like Boulajel or, or whatever his name was, um, you know, backing teams there, and and I'm not sure how long that'll last. Um, yeah. No, mate. It's. It's uh, it's um, it, it's 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 disappointing to see what's happening around the world. And what's that's sad. because there's too many. Teams. Yeah, what, what's really sad, isn't it? Isn't it? Is let's be honest, is seeing empty stadiums. Um, that is really really sad. Clashes in fixtures with international games potentially and club games that doesn't help. Um, if I know you've mentioned the British League before. And then you've mentioned yep. Italians joining the French league and South African yep. teams going back to, to, to the, the hemisphere where you are. Can, explain that for us. So some people listen that maybe haven't heard that kind of idea you've got, because it could okay. work this. Yes, it is. It's true. It could work, but it needs England to realize their real position in the world of rugby and to stop being selfish. Um, so you would have, I haven't got the num figures in front of me, but you'd have two divisions and you'd have, a various number of English teams, Scottish, Irish and Welsh teams, 
in the in what they might you might call the Premier League, and then in the Championship you'd have you'd have a mix of those four teams, and you'd have promotion and relegation because you want to see the the competition go right to the end of the season, like they do in football. Mm-hmm. Right now they're ring fencing the Premiership in in England. So if you're going to be coming, you know, in the bottom half, why would you go and watch them? You know, there's, what, what's compelling now to get the people out of their lounge rooms to go and watch those games? Promotion and relegation is the one thing that I think could really, really continue to to get people up and off their backsides. But um, you, it'll have to happen, the, a British and Irish league. You know, in the, in the top division, you'd start off with, what, what seven English, um, you know, two, two Welsh, that's nine... Two Irish, one Scottish, um, and then in the next team you'd have another Eng- a Welsh team. You'd have predominantly England English teams, but you'd have another Welsh team and a couple of Irish teams and and Scot and, and a Scottish team. You need those English clubs in there because that's where the money's going to come from, mostly, right? Sponsorship, broadcasting rights. So you've got to have more English teams than perhaps you'd like to see. But I have to tell you, you I don't even have to tell you because you're a student of the game, obviously. If you've got Bath and those coming across the bridge to play Cardiff, you know, yeah. uh, Clenethley um, and Full House, and Newport, full house yeah. yeah, absolutely. But wh- how many supporters do these South African teams bring? They might bring a bit of money, but what's it doing for the game for crying out loud? You know, the spectators don't know when games are on. They don't know who's playing. You know, I mean, it's it's um, it's a disaster. But mind you, it's not just a disaster there. Look what happened to Super Rugby yeah. down here. Yeah. When it first started, the rest of the world looked at it and said, wow, look at this. Then they decided, oh, no, that's not good enough. We need 15 teams, 18 teams, 100 teams, whatever it is. Because, you know, one of the biggest problems with administrators, mate? Go on. In rugby especially, they go for – Quantity over quality every single time. And that's what you've got with all these 16 teams in the URC and, and, and what have you, you know, 14 teams as it was in England. It's now down to 10. I mean, you know, and it's the same down in the Southern Hemisphere. You know, Australia should only have three teams. They were the most successful in the professional era when they had three professional teams. Then they went to five and look at them. They're a shambles. I, 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 I like. I, I think every fan would be going, yeah, that sounds good. That's a league I want to watch. That's competitive. Do you know what I mean? It makes sense as well. But what I always think, is that a pipe dream? So you're, the, I think, the right person to ask this question to. Who are the people, who are the parties who need to sit down together to maybe start this conversation seriously and get this ball rolling? Because that, that, how does it happen? How do we push it forward? Okay, so you've got to get a group of people who know what they're talking about, understand rugby, understand the fans, and unfortunately rugby mostly just, and we'll get on that in a minute too, I've got some very, very, very strong views about the way fans are treated in rugby these days. Um, But, you know, get some people who are prepared to leave their egos at the door, really, literally, leave their egos at the door or don't go into the meeting if you can't because you're the wrong person, you're not a solution, and sit down and thrash out what is best for what. Not not what's best for Welsh rugby, Irish rugby, English rugby. What is best for rugby, right? And they never do it. I wrote something on LinkedIn the other day about the politics, about how sport rugby says, oh, there's no place for, for politics, and they're talking about politicians in rugby. Well, they're the biggest bloody politicians you could ever come across within rugby. You know, it's all about politics and it's all about ego. And unless they can get themselves out of that, it'll never change. In a way, does it need to be done by people that maybe don't support a team, that don't follow rugby because their heart is invested too much in it? Because if we're talking about a restructure where we have to potentially drop a region or pick yeah. one Scottish team and one Scottish team to be in, in League in League Two or, or and one in the Premiership, then people, obviously, they're not going to want the region to be dropped or Glasgow not to be involved or Osprey's not to be involved, for example. 
Yeah, well, that's those are the tough calls. That businesses, now you all say rugby's a business, right? The businesses that make those calls in a heartbeat, right? And then people get on with it because it's not sustainable and it's not sustainable the way it's going. So you have to make some hard calls. But what you have to do is is actually make the, the calls that are most likely least offensive, but they're going to be offensive to some people. Mm. You know, that's a great word that gets thrown around a lot these days, being offended. Um, and, um, you know, you're going to offend some people. But if you want this sport to exist in 50 years' time, you better they better start doing things now and they better start doing things that make the game safer, simpler, um, and that's not happening. Here's a, question. Here's a question, David, right? Is there a person involved, in your opinion, in world rugby right now who, that can lead this change? Because no. no. I'm sorry. That's just the way I look at it. And then don't get me going on the boards where all these, all these sports are saying, well, we need, we need all these guys from the big end of town to come in and bring all of their business experience. As soon as they do get involved in the sport, all of their experience in the big business, big end of town goes out the window. All you had to do was look at the most recent chairman of um, Australian rugby to see what a disaster that was. And it's a disaster. So what you need is you need people with balance, a balanced view about the future. And, mate, I, honestly, and I'm only saying that there's nobody that I think could do this job because nobody is demonstrating that they actually understand what needs to be done. Take private equity, right? So they're dancing around and they're dancing with private equity. And they're all strutting around thinking this is great. Well, CBC hasn't been great for um, for the Premiership, hasn't been great for Six Nations yet, um, and certainly not in Wales. Do you know the people that suffer the most as a result of private equity? Are the fans. Because the fans, because private equity to get the return that they want out of the game um, are going to have to gouge the fans. I don't know what the tickets prices were for the um, for the internationals and in the, in the stadium now, but mate, I can tell you they'll be high. Yeah, yeah, I think that's something. The, that's fan, the fans actually. Something think about this for a minute. The fans provide every single um, penny of the revenue for the game, other than those guys who who think they're investing in the game. But, that, but then they need a return, right? But the fans, what do they do? They buy the tickets. They buy the merchandise. They buy the hospitality. They, um, they buy the broadcasting packages, right? Increasingly, they're the ones that gamble. They are putting every single, every single bit of value into it. Now, what they're going to cop by way of these uh, private equity is they're going to have to pay more and more and more for it. I, I, I su suggested... When New Zealand stupidly did a deal with Silver Lake, that um, you watch and see how many games the All Blacks will have to go and play overseas for gate share. We already find out that they're going to be playing two home games overseas next year. So, what does that do for the fans when they're taking your games? You, you take Welsh, the Welsh, right? So, Wales is going to say, we're going to take one of our three home games for the Six Nations, we're going to play it overseas. Or England's going to play a game overseas. Would they ever do that? Would they? No. Yeah. It's crazy when you say it like that, isn't it? Um, I, do, I want to get back to private equity if we can, but just yeah. quickly to play devil's ad advocate with what you just said. <clears throat> you say the fans, the fans are the game, right? Without no fans, there's no money coming into it. Yeah. What do we do about the debate then that if we're going to have to drop certain regions and teams and then ask yes. that fan base to go, can you now support this team instead? What do we do about that? Because that's an issue, isn't it? Yeah, it's only an issue in Wales, though. Okay. Right? Well, because, well, is it? Is, yeah. Of that yeah. But, and well, it's potentially an issue here as well um, with the sort of regional stuff that we've got in New Zealand. But that's already... I mean, it's already a shambles anyway. So, so, so how, how do we it, how do we fix that then? How, or how can we get around that to improve to improve the greater good of the game? 
there's this idea, but it's some people have to suffer. How do we convince the fans there's to get ways, to buy in? There's two ways you can do it in Wales. One is to ditch regions and just go to super clubs. And that's why we didn't do it at the time. But everybody thinks that, that those four clubs are super clubs, other than perhaps the Ospreys, but they struggle bad, badly anyway. So ditch regions, say we're just going to have these three teams. They're the three teams. You can support them or not. It's up to you, right? Or else you can go and have a look at the Mofesto from 2014 where I suggested that what they needed to do was to create four distinct, um, um, well, they're not, they're not regions. They're, what are they, moment, I think they've got 11 um, districts, right? Oh, yeah, fine. So instead of having that 11 districts, if I think it's 11, make, make it four districts um, and then that team, that team represents that district. And there's a whole lot of stuff around that as well. That would be the only way that you could actually do it and maintain this sort of <clears throat> ownership by the fans of, of a district, a district um, team that represents that district. Because there's a district play. So perhaps if we had, and I've said this often, if we hadn't have gone down that regional but sort of said, okay, you don't need 11 districts, right? We'll just make it. You have four districts and those ones on on the boundaries, well, you can make up your mind which one you're going to be in, um, but it's going to be four districts. And this team, A, B, C and D, they will represent. That's the only way you can do it. How else can you do it? There's only two options. Yeah, and that's where it gets tough, isn't it? You know, because also in that, there, no, no. there's too, many, there's too yeah. many teams to support, so that's why you went for four regions, right? Because... Too many teams yeah. is a bad thing as well sometimes. Um, yeah. Okay, let's go. Let's go to CVC because you, you you mentioned CVC in a lot yeah. of interviews that you do. Um, yeah. And for those who don't know, fans out there, who are CVC and what exactly do they do and what do they provide for world rugby? Because they've got stakes in Six Nations, URC, Gallagher Prem, and probably other places as well. Yeah. Well, they're a private equity company um, who got a lot of success with Formula One. And I think they they made about three billion pounds or something profit on the way out when they sold it. They ran it very well. But there's a big difference. Formula One, they owned. They owned the entire sport. <laughs> they're, not, they're not owning the entire sport of rugby. And that is, that is where I think that they've made a mistake by thinking that they're going to come in all these different countries that have different ways in which they run things, uh, and not all very well either. Um, but their, their primary aim is to give their, their, their shareholders or whatever, however they, they function, a, a return on their investment. That's all they're interested in. They're not interested in the sport. They're interested in making as much money as they can, as quickly as they can, you know. And if it's not working, they'll either get out or else they will change the model. Now, I'll give you something that you, you may not have thought about, but I think that there is a real possibility that the Six Nations with CVC on board could look at replacing world rugby. Well, that, that was actually something I've written down here. What part could they play in the future? Six so, Nations. So they just take complete control of that uh, as a, a single yeah. identity. Is that what you mean? So pretty much they've got control of world rugby anyway, you know, with those, with the exception of Italy, um, those, those nations up there are pretty much a bit like India in cricket. Mm -hmm. that's, where it's six, that's where I see Six Nations. Now, do I think that's a good thing? Not really. Because if you've got an organisation like CVC in there, um, I don't think that's going to be good for the soul of rugby, which we've lost. Right? Um, but that's why I think you have to split out the, um, the community game from the professional game. And let the professional game go its way. Get some money from it but prove to them that you can actually stand on your own two feet as a community guy. 
So would you welcome um, that then? Would you welcome CBC getting involved and taking over World Rugby and making it more really? of a, biz- a business? Because it would uh, give you, it really. possibly would, it would make it work. Not really because, um, well, put it this way. If I, if I was comfortable with the position that the community, community rugby was in, then I wouldn't care about professional rugby, what they did, how much money they lost, who went broke, who's going to go broke. Um, we'll just, the community game, community game will continue to provide them with players. Yeah. Right? And, that, and that's it. That's why golf is pretty much organised, isn't it? You know, you've got the PGA, Live Golf, you know, they, 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 and the average, the average guys, you know, go and play their golf at their local club, you know. It's a separation. And it's got to, and I think it's got to be separated. It's a good idea. I like my golf and I like, know you like your golf as well. Um, David, it's been absolutely fascinating to have you on. Thank you so much for your time today. Just as a, as a part in statement, if change doesn't happen, where is World Rugby in four years, next World Cup? The same, the same place as, as it is now. I mean, it's, um, it's a bit of a shambles, to be perfectly honest with you. And, um, you know, I, I made a comment the other day that the Six Nations is the best rugby, and I made it on here as well, mm-hmm. the rug, best rugby competition in the world of rugby. But then I and then I see all these people talking about the fact that, like Wales, they're building to the next World Cup. Why? Comes around once every four years. Wales should concentrate on winning every single game, right? And particularly those games against England, and particularly the Six Nations. That should be their focus. Gatlin shouldn't be focusing on on four years' time. He should be focusing on winning the best rugby competition in the world because when you get to the World Cup and you get into those knockout stages and Wales had a cruisy old run through the draw this year, but presumably that – or last year, but presumably that won't happen again, right? But why do they focus on the World Cup? It's a shit tournament, you know, you can tell. I can tell you now the top twelve teams that'll make the the top twelve. May, basically, I'd most likely be able to tell you who the top four teams would be. But we don't know now, even who's going to win the Six Nations. Do you think? I mean, I don't think Warren Gatlin might say, "Oh, yes, yeah, a new cycle. We're going building for the World Cup." But I don't think he actually believes that. He, he he's concentrating on the here and now. He's doing the best he can out of the squad and every other coach in the Six Nations, their focus is winning the Six Nations this year, in my opinion. I don't think they're well, they actually should, thinking about the World Cup. The unions well, might be. Should, yeah, but they should stop talking about it then. You yeah. know, they, shouldn't <laughs> mention, they, they shouldn't mention the Rugby World Cup in buddy four years' time. You know, they should be just focused on, well, you know, we've got Ireland next week. How tough is that going to be? 36-0 against Italy. I do watch the results, mind you. Yeah, I yeah. Watch the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm, but I'm more interested in Tottenham's results these days, mate, because I've been a Spurs supporter since I was born, really. I've, I've traced our family back to 1750 in oh, Tottenham. There, there you go. Well, Brennan Johnson scored the winner for you the other day as well. Oh, yeah. A Welsh boy. Yeah, you know? in, in injury time. He's a yeah. player, you know. I reckon him. I think he's a really good player, Brennan Johnson. Yeah, yeah. Um, so is that is that a priority when you come to when you come to the UK? You go and see Spurs play. Uh, I haven't seen them play play for for a no, for a decade, long time. To be well, the last time I saw them play, they got beaten in a um, an FA Cup final uh, at our stadium. You know when yeah. when they were redeveloping Wembley. Yeah, yeah. They came down and they played they played at finals in um, at the Millennium, and. Um, and I was when I was there, and um, they got beaten. Um, but um, no, they're well. They've got a great coach at the moment. Understands. Yeah. He, here's here's the thing. I'll leave you with. Yeah, go on. Bill Nicholson, who you most likely never heard of, but he no. was a great manager, Tottenham manager. Did the fir- first team to do the double in 1960-61. He has many sayings, but the one that sticks with me always always is. We can either play the game that we want to play or we can play the game the way our fans 
want us to play. And that's what Poster Coglu is doing at the moment. Mm. Something for everyone to ponder that, isn't it? Because what helps you make that decision as well? Because money might take you one direction, heart might take you the other one, in my opinion. Uh, um, and, well, in the Welsh context, it's understanding that innate b- ability that still exists in the kids coming up, that innate ability to be able to play like JPR and those sorts of players. It's still there, but it gets coached out of them. Yeah. Fantastic. David Moffat, thank you so much for your time today. today. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I know it's late there now in New Zealand, but tomorrow morning, get on that golf course, get that handicap down for us. <laughs> thank you. See you thank later. you, David. Thank you. Cheers. Please remember to click follow wherever you listen to this podcast so it's delivered to you as soon as it's out every single Monday. Tell your friends about us and share the love and we'll catch you next week. Wherever you go, wherever you are, enjoy your Sporting Wales week. Sport in Wales podcast. Supported by Dragon Bet. Your go-to for Welsh sports news and views.